Most of you guys are getting into medical. You may benefit from these lectures. Certain years, I skip it. Certain years, the uh, this is online. Things are going fairly fast, so you might as well just cover it. Eyes of the Earth were ready to so behold the origins of the Big Bang. Who could have thought that this dream come true would soon become astronomy's worst nightmare? Almost immediately, the solar panels caused problems. Every 45 minutes, Hubble moved from sunlight to darkness with an abrupt temperature shift of hundreds of degrees. The sharp temperature changes caused the arrays to contract or expand, shaking the delicate machine for several minutes. Hubble had a bad case of the jitters and no way to get rid of them. Tests over the next few weeks revealed an even more puzzling problem. Data from the 94-inch mirror simply didn't make sense. It seemed to indicate that the mirror could not focus. As the evidence mounted, no one was eager to confront the possibility of a major malfunction. The primary contractor who had built the mirror and the telescope, and who was nominally in charge of helping to set up and align the optics, was saying in this period that there wasn't a problem. So I was on the one hand saying there was a problem. The official contractor on the other hand was saying there wasn't a problem. And then all at once, the problem was too obvious to deny. A mistake in the primary mirror, an optical error one fortieth of the thickness of a human hair, had left Hubble seriously flawed. The astronomical community was devastated. It was finally in late June that the final data came in, and we couldn't deny it. And it was just a crushing blow. I mean, I remember getting a call on a Sunday afternoon, and I was crushed. The mirror disaster was immediately followed by a public relations fiasco. The press and public savaged NASA for its apparent hubris and incompetence. Coming just four years after the space shuttle Challenger tragedy, Hubble's plight made many wonder if NASA could do anything right. The summer of 1990 was filled with scathing editorials and brutal cartoons. The most complex scientific instrument ever built had become a national joke. All right, so the eyes of the Earth. What caused the flaw in the mirror? All right, so because of the flaw in the design of the mirror, all of a sudden the image quality got completely compromised. All right, obviously they ran tests whenever they were actually cutting the glass, and everything was fine. All of a sudden they sent it in space, and they discovered the flaw. So the question is. What caused it? Why is it that the tests were fine here on Earth and all of a sudden in space? And, and then the mirror ends up changing its shape a little bit. Okay, so. Impressions here up by my one A. Okay, guys. Um, when you're looking at this, there's quite a few stuff which is out of place. Can you guys see, identify quite a few things. All right, so obviously you got a mirror, you're looking at a mirror re re reflection. And this is, you're looking at things from the perspective of this person. And if it's a mirror reflection that you're looking at, obviously things have to look in a certain way and things are way off. So the question is why, or what is off? Or like not the question why, it's impressions, which means that <laughs> it's things that kind of made up. You're going with the impression of this person of what things should look like. All right, a couple of things that I'm gonna identify. All right, so things are gonna look off because they're in violation of the law of reflection. All right, number one, if you're looking at, at this person flat on, straight on, if the mirror is right behind, all right, it's so a flat mirror in the background, you should not be able to see yourself and you should not be able to see her back. Okay, so that's one of the things which are gonna be on. The next thing that you're looking at are these bottles that you're looking at. All right, notice that the bottles are actually right at the edge. And then if you're looking at the reflection, notice that they are actually towards the other end, they're pushed away. All right, so those are the major ones that I can see that they are in violation of the law of reflection in essence. So what's wrong with this painting? What's wrong with this painting is it does not follow the law of reflection. All right, so that's what it is. Notice that this person looks inverted, so the question is why. This person looks magnified. Once again, the question is why. All right, so a lot of the times, okay, so they're actually heating water, believe it or not, in this case. So you heat up the water, or it's not even water, this is oil, and then you can turn it into steam, and then using pressurized steam, obviously, you can generate electricity because it's going to rise up. All right, so what you need to do is you need to focus the light onto these uh, pipes that you're looking at. So instead of using spherical mirror, mirrors, they use parabolic mirrors. So the question is why? All right, so the, the light has to be focused at that point. So purpose of the parabolic mirrors versus the spherical mirrors. Okay, so that question doesn't make too much sense to you right now, but it will. All right, so notice that it looks smaller. So the question once again is why? Oh, <laughs> 
Here's a dude with way more than enough free time on his hands. All right, so when the image is captured, I noticed that the captured image tends to be much smaller than the actual object. So once again, the question becomes why or how. And then when you have a film, which has very small images, she can magnify those images. It's hard to imagine what an astonishing magic trick motion pictures must yes, be. A moving painting in light, telling the stories of people nothing like us and just like us. A diversion from the cares of daily life. It wasn't until D.W. Griffith in the uh, second decade of the century that people suddenly began to recognize that this was a new art. Well, beyond the fact that it's an art form, equivalent to that of theater, equivalent to that of painting and music, it is a great documentarian uh, of all peoples. Moving film has made possible a historical record which hitherto never existed. If we had had film in the, age, in the days of ancient Greece, my God, what, what a sense of history we could, we could have. The motion pictures have changed our perception of how other people live, think, feel, act, and behave. We all model ourselves to some degree on the people in the movies. I hope to become something like William Powell, Robert Montgomery, or Rex Harrison, or Bang, Graceful, Woody. But I failed in that. But in addition, they were very entertaining. Movies are the distinctive art of the 20th century. All right. <clears throat> And then on top of that, you got the magnifying glasses. Obviously, you can magnify whatever it is that you're looking at, or you can have diverging lenses. You got something big, and you can make them smaller. Sometimes, when the full moon rises in the sky, it appears much larger near the horizon than it does when it's positioned higher in the sky. Some observers judge the moon to be as much as 50 to 75 percent larger when it first appears. But is the full moon really larger when it's near the horizon? Okay, so that's a good question. Horizon. Okay, so. It is 75% larger when it first appears. But is the full moon really larger when it... Some observers horizon than it does when it's positioned higher in the sky. Some observers judge the moon to be as much as 50 to 75% larger when it first appears. Okay, so the question is, is this something that we can explain using physics, or is this just an illusion of the mind? But is the full moon really larger when it's near the horizon? There's other questions that we'll get to investigate. All right, so speaking of the plane mirrors, Okay, we've done this before. All right, so you got the angle of instance and reflection, they're the same. This is known as the live reflection. Okay, so how this comes about, you got the conduction electron. So this is kind of like a video of review. So you got the incoming light. All right, so here's the electric field component. Electric field acting on the free charges will just vibrate those free charges, right? And the, the oscillating or accelerating charges will generate their own electromagnetic field. So there's gonna be a wave interference between the incidence of incoming electromagnetic waves and newly re-radiated electromagnetic waves. And then it looks to me like the only surviving component is the reflected component whose angle is gonna match the angle of incidence. All right, so that becomes the reflection from, a, from an atomic scale. All right, so you got a plane mirror. Okay, now we've got to set up the terminology for the classical physics. You got the object. All right, so um, you got the plane mirror, angle of incidence, the angle of reflection. So you will get to see the reflected ray. And then the light has a tendency to see things in a straight line. Remember that brain making up its own reality. So the brain is going to make up its own reality as if the object is located inside the mirror. This is known as a virtual image. Virtual meaning that there's nothing there. It's just the reality that the brain itself makes up. All right. So this is the illusion of reality. Speaking of the illusion of reality, it's going to take a much deeper meaning when we start to get into quantum physics. All right. So here's your object distance. Here's your image distance. This is not very clear in terms of mathematics. Obviously, we already had a discussion regarding what's wrong with this painting. It just, it's just complete in violation of the laws of uh, this. So, a couple of things. The image is going to be virtual. If it happens in front of the mirror, it's known as real. If it happens uh, behind the mirror or within the mirror, inside the mirror, uh, it's known as virtual. So if it's upright, obviously, it looks like that. Direct, upright, they mean the same thing, depending upon the book that you're using. Things written, published 20 years ago, they used to say erect, and now it's a little bit more political part to say upright. So if it's a plain mirror, what do we know? The image is going to be upright. It's going to be virtual, meaning that it's behind. It's going to appear behind the mirror. Or it's going to be in your head. All right, so be the best answer. Sometimes when the full moon rises in the sky, it appears much larger near the horizon than it does when it's positioned higher in the sky. 
Some observers judge the moon to be as much as 50 to 75 percent larger when it first appears. But is the full moon really larger when it's near the horizon? Okay, guys, speaking of the virtual images, that's not the reality that the brain makes up is what I'm interested in. A lot of people mistakenly think that you end up seeing the mirror, the mirror is going to look larger because it's going to look unified. So the question is how all of a sudden that becomes a question. All right, so let's talk about spherical mirrors. All right, so spherical mirrors, you've got both sides usually reflective in this case. It's just a arc of inside surface is going to be reflective, the outside surface is going to be reflective. If you're looking at the inside surface, reflection from an inside surface, this is known as a concave mirror. If you're looking at the reflection from the outside surface, it's known as a convex mirror. All right, so a couple of things to focus on. We've got the principal axis. All right, so the things will happen along the principal axis. I'll explain why. All right, so it's right at the middle. A couple of things on the principal axis. We got the C, all right, or use the letter R. All right, C and R, this is the radius of curvature that you're looking at. All right, radius of curvature, if you're looking at the entire mirror, that would be the radius of the sphere that you're looking at. All right, so the C stands for center. All right, the center is obviously you're looking at the radius from center to the uh, edge or perimeter of the sphere that you're looking at. All right, so center, radius of curvature, center, radius of curvature, that's it. All right, so that, uh, that'll become important in terms of figuring out the focal point. All right, so notice that you got the incident rays. Incident rays will always be parallel to the principal axis. And things will happen on the principal axis, which will become the point of discussion shortly. So you got incident rays, these are the laser beams, they're parallel to each other, they get reflected. And then upon reflection, notice that they converge to a point. That point of convergence on the optical axis is known as the focal point. All right, so one thing about the focal point that I want you to know is just eyeball that just briefly. All right, there's the center. This is, your, this is the radius of curvature that you're looking at. Notice that the distance to the focal point relative to the center with the radius of curvature, the focal point is going to be half the distance. All right, so if you know the radius of curvature, if you divide it by half, if you divide it by two, it's going to give you the focal point of the mirror, in essence. All right, it doesn't matter that it's, it's a concave or convex mirror. It's the same thing. All right, so the point of convergence is the focal. All right, so this distance is known, known as the focal point, this is the focal point, so that's the distance to the focal. And this is the center, so this is the radius of curvature. All right, so that's your focal length. All right, distance to the focal is the focal length, this is the radius of curvature. You got the radius of curvature, so focal length is gonna be half the distance. So you guys have seen the answers. The focal length is gonna be half the distance of the radius. All right, so a couple of ways you can figure out what's gonna happen to the object. Okay, so. Will this object be inverted? Is it going to be larger? Is it going to be smaller? The image is, will the image be real? Or is it going to be virtual? All right, so we will have a bunch of questions that we will get to answer. All right, so there are two ways of figuring this out. Number one, you could do it visually by drawing out a bunch of rays. Number two, you can also figure this out by using a little bit of mathematics. So we will get to do it both ways. So we'll use a little bit of math, and then we will also do it visually by using ray diagrams. OK, so speaking of ray diagrams, we'll get to follow three rules in terms of setting this up. All right, the one that you're looking at is known as rule number one. You notice that there's a rule. All right, so here's the incident ray. Upon reflection, it's gonna go through the focal pole. All right, so notice that the ray is starting from the top of the object. So that's the one that we will get to follow. So the reflected ray is gonna go through the focal pole. Here's your rule number two. Ray going through the focal point is gonna get reflected parallel to the principal axis. All right, so the ray going through the focal point upon reflection is gonna go parallel to the principal axis. All right, so we got two rays. Ray going to the going parallel to the principal axis upon reflection will go through the focal point. The ray going through the focal point upon reflection is going to go parallel. Reflected ray is going to parallel to the focal axis. It's going to parallel to the principal axis. And then the third rule simply says the ray lined up along the center is going to get reflected onto itself. All right. So notice that the ray, which is lined up with the center of curvature or radius of curvature or the center of curvature. Is going to get reflected onto itself. All right, so we got three rules. Ray parallel to the principal axis is going to go through the focal point of reflection. Ray going through the focal point of reflection is going to go parallel to the principal axis. And ray, which is lined up with the radius of curvature or the center of curvature, is going to get reflected upon itself. That's it. These are the three rules. So what can you do with these three rules? All right, I'll show you what, what you can do with them shortly. Just pick out the best answer. Oh. 
that instruction. Yeah, I think that's right. All right, so what do we have? We've got a light ray. It's traveling parallel to the country near its axis. So that's the principal axis. It was striking mirror surface near its midpoint, which means that after reflection, all right, so it's moving parallel after reflection, it should go right through the focal, right? Focal point. So, okay, it's not correct. Travels at right angles, that's not right. Pass through the nearest center curve, which that's not true. It'll pass through the nearest focal point. So it didn't All right, so we got a light arriving at a concave mirror on a path through the center of curvature. And you know, this light is reflective, right? So it's going to get reflected onto itself. So the best answer is going to be B. All right, so concave mirrors. Um, yeah, this is one of those things that we would have done in class. We have in person education. If you have a concave mirror, how do you know what the radius of curvature is? So you would be looking at a distant object just like that. And we're more like we would be using laser light in that sense. So everything is going to be converging to your point. The point of convergence is going to be focal length. Obviously, you double the distance, so it would give you the radius of curvature. All right, so let's just play with the idea. So this person looks inverted, so the question is why? So what caused the inversion? And let's figure this out. So. Okay, so this is the non-reflective surface. The reflective surface is going to be on the inside. This is the focal length. This is the radius of curvature. Place the person outside of the radius of curvature. All right, so here's the object itself. And that let's just find a point of convergence for the uh, by using the ray rules. All right, so instant ray upon reflection is going to go through the focal point. The ray going through the radius of curvature is going to get reflected back onto itself. All right, this becomes a point of convergence right there. All right, so you will get to see the image right here. So the image is right there. It's gonna be inverted. It's gonna be smaller, it's gonna be inverted, and it's gonna be real. So, which means that this person is gonna appear in front of the mirror, in essence. And he's gonna look inverted. So the conclusion is, if the object is outside of the radius of curvature, the image is gonna be real, it's gonna be smaller, and it's gonna be inverted. All right, so that's what should happen. All right, so likewise, you've got the, uh, Handle. Okay, so you can use two out of three rules. I end up using two because it's easier. The only thing you have to do is just find the point of convergence for two out of three rules that you got. Here's the first rule the reflected ray goes through the focal point. Here's the second one the ray going through the, the center of curvature is going to get reflected back onto itself. This becomes a point of convergence. The third rule is the ray which is going through the focal point upon reflection is going to go parallel to the principal axis. So this becomes a point of convergence. So what that means is you will see this candle upside down, inverted, and it's gonna look smaller. That's it. All right, so here's it. Here's what it is. It's gonna look like it's in front of it in reality, not inside of it. And likewise, this is the reason why the person looks inverted. All right, whether the person is gonna be smaller or larger depends on where the object is located relative to the, um, the radius of curvature. All right, if you place the object between your focal length as well as the radius of curvature, notice that the reflected image all right, let's find the point of convergence in this case. It's going to be upside down. That's fine, just like the previous case. Except this time, it's going to be uh, upside down. It's going to be real, but this time it's going to be bigger. It's going to be larger. So conclusion in this case is the image is going to be real. It's going to be larger. It's going to be inverted upside down. All right. So the object is, uh, you got a small object. And we're using a concave mirror. And the image is going to be real, it's going to be inverted in this case. So now we're going to be looking at the image right here. We're going to be looking at an inverted image. It's going to appear in front of the mirror. And it's going to be upside down. All right, so let's analyze this. So we have an object which is positioned between a concave mirror center of curvature and its focal point, right? So it's between the center of curvature and the focal length. So there's going to be an image which is going to reproduce what do we know. It's going to be inverted. It's going to be larger. It's going to be outside of the radius of curvature. So A is correct. It's going to be out past the center of curvature. So that's correct. B is not correct. It's not going to be at the center of curvature. C is not correct. It's not going to be between the center of curvature and the focal point. So uh, which means that A is the best answer for this one. All right. So the question becomes, why am I doing this? Oh, okay. I think I'm setting up the mathematics now. Okay. 
Now that we know how to do it using ray diagrams, now let's set up the mathematics. So e, O is going to represent the object, I is going to represent the image. F is your focal length in terms of meters. P, okay, I'm using the traditional book notation. So P is going to represent the object distance. So that's the distance of the object to the surface of the mirror. The surface of the mirror is going to measure with respect to center in that sense. Q is going to represent the image distance. So P is the object distance, Q is the image distance. Everything is expressed in terms of meters. And so this is known as a mirror equation or lens equation. All right, so that's what we will get to use. All right, so reciprocal of the focal length is going to equal to the reciprocal of the object distance plus reciprocal of the image distance. So that's the formula that we will get to use. And then we'll have to worry about the magnification. H is going to be object height. All right, and then we'll use H prime. Okay, so H prime is right here, so it becomes the image height. Once again, these are going to be expressed in terms of meters. So the magnification is the image height, how much larger or smaller the image is relative to the object height. So it's going to be H prime divided by H. Or another expression of it is it's going to be the negative of the object this image distance to the object distance. All right, so the question becomes, this one is kind of straightforward, but this one is not so straightforward. And furthermore, why do we have a negative sign in front of Okay, so I think there's going to be a simple derivation coming up. All right, we'll discuss that shortly. Um, okay, let's do this and then go take a break. I'm getting real tired here. All right, so what do we have? Um, we got a two centimeter object, so that's the height of the object that you're looking at. So this is it. It's going to be a place 7.1 centimeters from a concave mirror, so that's your object distance. So this is what we're looking at. And we got the radius of curvature, which is C, which is this. All right, so object happens to be located between the radius of curvature, which is this, and the concave, the, the focal length. Focal length is going to be 5.1 centimeters. Be after that. So find the location of the image. So the image is going to be outside of the radius of curvature, because you should be able to visualize this at this point. All right. So it's going to be outside. It's going to be inverted. It's going to be real. So can we figure out the actual size of the image? So it's going to be larger. Can we figure out the location of the image, which means the image distance. All right. So stuff that we know how to do visually using ray diagrams. Now let's try to do it mathematically. Okay, we it's number three. Oh, don't have the mathematics for this one? Oof. Maybe it's gonna come up. I don't know. Because I want to make a point there. Okay, I don't see it there. Oh, let's do this and then just go take a break. All right. If the object is located within the focal length, uh, by using the rules, ray, ray diagrams, in essence. So reflective rays gonna go through the focal point. And let's use the second rule. The ray, which is um, along the direction of the radius of curvature is gonna get reflected upon itself. All right, so the reflected rays are in front of the mirror, but there's, they diverge, there's no point of convergence in front of the mirror. So the best thing to do is just extend these rays into the mirror and find a point of convergence. Notice that the rays will converge inside the mirror. All right, so the point of convergence is gonna be inside the mirror and the point of convergence is gonna be upright. So the image is gonna be upright, it's gonna be larger and it's gonna be virtual. In this case, as a result, you're gonna end up seeing yourself within the mirror. We're gonna end up seeing a magnified image of yourself inside the mirror. So that's what it means. All right. Um, Okay, and then using three of those, once again, you end up getting the same thing. Virtual image, it's gonna be upright. It's gonna look magnified. All right, so if the object is situated in a concave mirror surface at its focal point, in this case, the image is gonna be virtual. It's gonna be erect. It's gonna be larger as well. So it's all right, guys. Um, what time is it? It's eight twenty-nine. It's eight thirty. Take a break for ten. All right, so let's continue with the lecture. Okay, so I did this already. So it's going to be virtual, it's going to be erect. It's going to appear. Okay. 
problem number one, evidently I don't have a solution for it. That check, I already checked that that has a solution. So stuff that I, I don't have a solution for, obviously I want you guys to do it on your own. These things are straightforward. So uh, we've got the object, which is placed six centimeters in front of a concave mirror. It's got a focal length, which is 10 centimeters. So which means that the object distance is gonna be smaller than the image, the focal length. So, um, which means that the image is gonna magnified, it's gonna be virtual and it's gonna be larger. It's gonna be magnified, virtual, it's gonna be upright. So that's what I'm, all right. So if you know the height of the object, this is the height of the object, it's gonna be 1.2 centimeters. So find the height of the image. All right, so we kind of know how to do it using the ray diagrams. Now, let's do the same thing using the mathematics. I want you guys to kind of get used to using the formula. That's it, okay, so I'm, this is more of an instrumentation thing because of simple reason that most of you guys are getting into medical fields, you will be using a bunch of instrumentations. All right, so what is P represent? P is gonna be the object distance, right? So it's gonna be six centimeters. Focal length is gonna be 10 centimeters. So question is Q, so what is the object? What's the image distance? All right, so the image is gonna be behind the mirror. And what else? And we also wanna know what the magnification is. Okay, so object height is gonna be 1.2 centimeters. So what is the image height? All right, so that's what we're looking at. All right, so we're using the mirror equation. So for Q, so Q is gonna give us the image distance in this case. All right, so which means that reciprocal of the P, you can just subtract it from both sides or just move it across, it becomes negative. And then just plug the numbers in. All right, and then it's gonna be 50, negative 15 centimeters. If it's negative, it's gonna be behind the mirror. Okay, if it's positive, if it's, so if it's negative, which means that the image is gonna be virtual which means that it's gonna be imaginary. If it's positive, it's, it's gonna be real in front of the mirror. So imaginary, virtual, they mean the same thing. Okay, so what else? Magnification. So you got the image distance divided by the object distance. That's one way of doing it. Okay, don't forget the negative sign. All right, so negative times negative is getting positive. All right, so from this, we can get magnification. Once you get the magnification, you can figure out the image height. All right, so the magnification here is gonna be fairly large. Uh, so it's going to be two and a half times larger than the object. So uh, this is going to be two and a half. Here's your object, so do a multiplication. So this is positive, that means that it's going to be upright. If it's negative, it's going to be inverted. So for H prime, so that's the image height. And then I'm plugging the numbers in, and it's going to be three centimeters. All right, so which means that the image is going to be two and a half times larger. So image is imaginary, it's going to be upright. It's going to be that work out. Simple math. Okay, so I'm gonna put the emphasis on the difference between spherical mirrors and the parabolic mirrors. Okay, yeah, so far we've been dealing with spherical mirrors. When you have spherical mirrors, obviously there's gonna be a focal point. The, the idea is the reflected rays will converge to a point and the point of convergence is the focal point. Except we got problems. The problem is um, depending upon the location of the rays relative to the principal axis is gonna matter. I noticed that the rays near the principal axis, they will converge to a point right at that point. Rays further away will end up converging to a point further away. All right, so which means that you're not gonna have a single convergence. You end up getting this fuzzy region. All right, so which means that using spherical mirrors usually don't work. It gives you something called, the, this is known as an optical aberration. You end up getting these optical aberrations. So it causes distortions of the images and all that stuff. So it's not the best thing. So the spherical mirror will always give you optical aberrations, especially if it's a big mirror like that. So the best thing to do is to come up with a parabolic mirror by shaping it right into a parabola. You can come up with a one single focal point. In many ways, radio telescope operates very similarly to an optical telescope in the sense that there's a large collecting area, a parabolic surface that uh, serves as a kind of a light bucket to collect the radio photons, the electromagnetic waves that come in from space. And the parabolic dish then focuses the radio waves into a receiver, which is then recorded uh, these days by computers. All right, so which means that they place the microphones or whatever the it is, collecting devices in this case. It is radio waves, obviously. You've got some microphones. The radio right wave. It's a, para a parabolic waves in dish that you're looking at. And this becomes a focal point. To a receiver, which is then. So the receiver is right at the focal of this. Recorded. So you don't have any sort of optical aberration. In recent years, there was another American space disaster. This one did not cause any loss of life, though it was a huge financial. All right, so what was wrong with the mirror? All right, so they've done the test and everything else while they were shaking the mirror here on Earth, and then they send it out into space, 
And then all of a sudden they end up getting these optical aberrations all over the place. So image quality wasn't there. You end up getting this fuzzy looking mess. And it was unusual in another way. It had a happy ending. The Hubble Space Telescope was a bitter disappointment to scientists from the day it was launched. But the Hubble was already in orbit before scientists discovered the main mirror was distorted, producing only about one third the resolution it was designed for. So the question becomes, why is it that the mirror was distorted? Everything was fine here on Earth. As soon as they sent it out in space and they noticed that the image quality wasn't there, Several. they end up getting all these distortions. Things had gone wrong. One, the mirror had been ground to almost unthinkably close tolerances, but in the wrong shape. Because it's only it's not the wrong shape. It's got the right shape, except one way distorted its shape in the gravity on Earth. Once freed of gravity, the mirror sprung into a slightly different shape. Well, in free fall, all of a sudden you don't have the same surface tension, right? So what happened was the mirror didn't have the same exact shape that it did while it was here on Earth, while they were shaping it, while they were actually cutting the mirror. And, and so it's it's not in the absence of gravity. There's still plenty of gravity, except the mirror now is in free fall. And all of a sudden the tension forces, surface tension wasn't the same. So the shape changed. Critics say it should have been tested for that. So the question is, how do you test something like that? We have an axiom here. One test is worth a thousand expert opinions. And this is a classic example where no one could figure out a very elegant way to test it in zero G. So they didn't. NASA had two choices. All right, so when they say zero G, you know it's not zero G, right? It's in free fall. They could abandon the hugely expensive project, or they could send a crew up to fix it. Astronaut Story Musgrave got the job. When he arrived in space, the Hubble was a mess. Putting in some new rate gyros, which had failed. I'm putting in the new Whitefield Planetary Camera, the deployable optics bench to correct for the spherical aberration. New magnetometers. Uh, the computer had lost half of its memory, replacing a coprocessor to get the memory back. All of uh, those kinds of tasks, if you added up the total amount of work uh, that we had to do, it came out to five days. At the end of it, the results were better than anyone had dared hope for. Since Story Musgrave's $50 million overhaul, the Hubble Space Telescope has looked farther into space than any instrument in history. A huge, costly engineering disaster that was fixed. All right, so they were able to fix the problem using lenses. All right, so the question is how? All right, that's gonna be the next lecture. Let's finish up the mirrors today and then move on. All right, so why does it look smaller? Okay, so let's talk about the convex mirrors. Convex mirrors. So instead of concave mirrors, now we've got the convex mirrors. We're not going to put a lot of emphasis on this one usually. Traditionally, concave mirrors get a lot of the emphasis. The convex mirrors, they don't have a lot of applications aside from side mirrors or whatnot. All right, so what's happening is once again, we will get to use the same rules, ray rules in essence. So notice that the light incident parallel to the optical axis upon reflection is going to get, it's going to converge to the focal point or more like the reflected ray. If you extend it into the mirror, it's gonna converge to the focal point. It's more like it. All right, so the ray parallel to the optical axis upon reflection, if you extend the reflected ray in the opposite direction into the mirror, it's gonna converge to the focal point. All right, so once again, we got three rules. All right, so ray parallel to the optical axis upon reflection can be extended through the focal point. The ray, which is lined up with the radius of curvature is gonna be reflected onto the cell or back onto the cell. The ray, which is um, pointing towards the focal point upon reflection is gonna go parallel to the optical axis. So they become the three ray rules that we're gonna be discussing. And then we're just gonna look at the extension of the reflective rays into the virtual space. And then we'll look for a point of convergence there. All right, so the convex mirrors. All right, so once again, everything looks the same. So you got your focal point, you got the radius of curvature on the other side, which is to be expected. Ray parallel to the optical axis is going to get reflected in a sense that the reflected ray can be extended into in through the focal point. Ray, uh, which is incident, incident ray, which is uh, pointing towards the radius of curvature, is going to get reflected onto itself. And this, lastly, all right, so the ray, which is incident towards the focal point, is going to get reflected, and the reflected ray is going to par be parallel to the optical axis. All right, so the point of convergence of the ref extended reflected rays, extended reflected rays into the virtual space is gonna be where the image is gonna form. So image is gonna be upright, so it's, it's gonna be virtual, it's gonna be upright, and it's gonna be smaller. All right, so that's it. All right, so that's the only application that we got for this. All right, so this is a convex mirror. Image is gonna be upright, it's gonna look smaller and that's it. Okay, so mathematically we will get to use the same equation or more likely equations. 
couple of things to notice here. So, um, all right, so object is going to be placed 66 centimeters in front of the mirror. So that's your object length, object distance that you're looking at. So that's going to be P, so that's going to be positive. Focal length, if it's beyond the mirror, it's going to be negative. Negative numbers indicate that you're in virtual space inside the mirror. All right, so the location of the image is going to be inside the mirror. So uh, that's the focal length. So you should get a negative number for that one. Relative size is going to be smaller. It's going to be upright. So which means that um, because it's upright, I think it will end up getting a positive number for that one. Okay, so you have to kind of use the same mathematical animation bar. Okay, so that was a quick review of mirrors. Let's talk about the lenses. She's just a small town girl with some big town dreams. Someone's getting lucky. Question is, who? Okay, so lenses. Okay, once again, we got converging lenses. Uh, so they look like this. And then we have the diverging lenses. They look like this. All right, so the diverging lenses will be concave and the converging lenses will be convex lenses. So converging, convex, and diverging, we got the concave lenses. All right, so the prism can be turned into a lens. Obviously, you have to shave it and then we shape it. And if you got a converging lens upon refraction, the light is gonna to converge to a point. The point of convergence is the focal point that becomes the focus in essence. All right, so you got the laser beam from the left going through the prism and notice that it converges to a point. So the point of convergence becomes the uh, focal point. All right, so this is the principal axis, principal focal point, that's what it says. And then you got the divergent lenses. Uh, these are the concave lenses. All right, so what's happening is you got the incident rays parallel to the optical axis. And then upon refraction, upon refraction, they end up diverging away. But if you're looking at the refracted rays, if you extend them in the opposite direction towards the in front of the lens, notice that they will converge to a point. Okay, I think there's a couple of things we need to discuss at this point. I need to introduce a few things. All right, when you're dealing with lenses, what happens on the other side of the lens? All right, this space is known as the real space in this case. All right, so this is gonna be our real space. That's where the things will happen. And if you're looking at, I think, it's, okay, if something is happening on the side, I think it's gonna be virtual space, but we'll, let's get back to shortly. All right, so once again, refracted ray, and then you trace it in the opposite direction to the space in front of the lens, and there's gonna be a point of convergence. So the point of convergence is gonna be the focal point at that point. All right, so usually I put the emphasis on the converging lenses because they got plenty of applications, <clears throat> quite a few. Okay, so which means that I'm setting up the ray diagrams, ray rules, basically three rules, once again, to get to follow. So the ray parallel to the optical axis on refraction is gonna go through the focal point. That's number one. Ray going through the focal point in front of the lens upon refraction is gonna go parallel to the optical axis. All right, so that's rule number two. The ray, which is directed towards the center of a lens is gonna go right through the lens without being refracted. Okay, so this is rule number three. All right, so these are the ray rules. And then the only thing we have to do is follow the rules and look for a point of convergence. All right, so point of convergence is where the image is gonna form. All right, so rule number one, this one, ray parallel to the optical axis upon refraction is gonna go through the focal point. Ray, rule number two, ray going through the focal point upon refraction is gonna go through, it's gonna go parallel to the optical axis and ray uh, directed towards the center is gonna go right through unrefracted. All right, so let's follow those rules. All right, so now let's focus on the image formation by a converging lens. Okay, did I not do this already? Okay, uh, all right, so I think this is the rule that we will get to play. All right, so the focal length, double the focal length, this is the radius of curvature. In terms of the mirrors, I'll stick to the same concept. All right, so the object is located here. So the object is outside of the radius of curvature. And then, all right, so the ray parallel to the optical axis of prime refraction is gonna go through the focal point. And this is rule number three, the ray, which is directed towards the center, is gonna go right through. All right, so we'll look for the point of convergence. So the convergence is gonna happen here. All right, so which means that the object is located here, the image is gonna be inverted. 
All right. Um, I don't have a reference in terms of this is offside. Okay. Twice the focal length. All right. So from the looks of it, the image is going to be smaller. It's going to be inverted, provided that twice the focal length is going to be located in half. All right, so the image is going to be forming on the other side, so it's going to be real. So we will assume that this is a real space. That's what I was getting at. As long as it's happening on the other side of the lens, it's converted, it's, it's considered real. It's going to be inverted. It's going to be smaller. Okay, so it goes down. All right, so the object is here, and uh, this is the object that you're looking at. All right, so this is your eyeball, obviously. Your eye eyeball is going to see the image as real, and the image is going to look inverted. All right, so this is not a magnifying glass, obviously. That's not the way it works. If this is what you're using, obviously, you will see the real image. It's going to look converted. All right, what could be the application of this? Uh, I don't know. Like a camera, maybe? All right, now you're going to experience reality from a perspective of a physicist. You guys are watching a commercial. This is, this is the only thing that I see usually. All right. <laughs> uh, most of you guys wouldn't even notice it. I go, oh man, this is so beautiful. All right, so <laughs> this water droplet acts like a uh, convex lens. This is just so beautiful. All right, so the object is gonna be outside of the radius of curvature that you're looking at. And then you end up seeing the image. The image is gonna be inverted. It's gonna be smaller. All right, and it's gonna look real. It's so beautiful, okay. Artistically, this looks really pretty, obviously. I, I do appreciate that, but at the same time, the physics of it, I, it's, it's so well done. The entire commercial is extremely well done. All right, guys, this is not what the cameras usually do. You take a real object, and so what do you do? You end up using a converging lens. So you got a big object, so it turns the object upside down and then captures a smaller image. So that's, that's what the camera is using. So the object is located outside of the radius of curvature. The image is going to be within the radius of curvature. It's going to be smaller, it's going to be upside down. All right, so this is the way the pictures are used. Digital or not, Mason. All right, that's the other one. All right, so that's how the cameras work. Object is outside of the radius of curvature. All right, so you have a converging lens. And obviously, the image is going to form within. It's going to be smaller. It's going to be upside down. And that's what the film is. OK, so this is from number four. I'm not sure if I have the solution. If I don't have the solution, you're on your own. All right, just get a physics book and find similar problems. These are fairly straightforward. All right, so what do we have? We got a person who's 1.7 meters tall. All right, and standing 2.5 meters in front of a camera. So the camera is using a conversion lens. It's got a focal length, so the focal length is given. So figure out the image distance, and then figure out whether or not the image is real or virtual. All right, so let me just take a look at it. So conversion lens, you see the focal length, we're at the, double the focal length, so that's gonna radius of curvature, so it's gonna point one meter, and this person's two and a half meters in front of it, so which means that the image is gonna be inverted, it's gonna be real, it's gonna be smaller, so that's what it means. Okay, so it should work out. All right, so surprise, surprise, I don't have that. Okay, I don't have the solution. Um, okay, so what if the object is between the radius of curvature and the focal length? What's gonna happen? All right, so you kind of know what's gonna happen this time. All right, so if you place the object here between the focal length and twice the focal length, the image is gonna be inverted once again. It's gonna be real. This time it's gonna be larger. All right, so just follow the ray diagram. You kind of come up with your common sense at this point. So here's the object, here's the image. The image is gonna be inverted. It's going to be real, it's going to be larger. All right, that's what should happen. All right, so this time, object is small. Obviously, you're magnifying the, you're magnifying the object and you're inverting the object at the same time. So, technology is It's hard to imagine what an astonishing magic trick motion pictures must have first appeared to be. A moving painting in light, telling the stories of people nothing like us and just like us. 
Yeah, uh, it's the same as the technology that we use in terms of showing films. Video projector, guys. The old movie projectors. All right, so obviously you got a film, which is fairly small. And then you have a converging lens. And then you place the film within the focal length and twice the focal length. And then obviously you have light behind it. And then this is where you place the screen. And obviously things need to be inverted. I um, did movies inverted, DJ. So you will get to see a real image. It's going to be right side up on how you set it up. So you can actually watch a nice little movie. All right, so that's the way the projectors used to work. So the image would be real, it would be on the screen, it would be magnified, so you can enjoy a good movie. Or at least a movie, good or bad, I don't know. All right, so what else do we have? <clears throat> okay, now, what causes the magnification of an image in this case? Notice that it's not inverted. It doesn't appear, um, be, the image is not gonna appear behind the lens. All right, and so what's causing that to happen? Uh, so this becomes a case number three. All right, if you place the object within the focal length, then we will have some problems. All right, you won't be able to find a point of convergence behind the lens. So, which means that the refracted rays need to be extended to the space in front of the lens. Uh, so, if the image forms here, it's known as virtual image. So, this space is known as the virtual space. All right, so which means that we will start looking for a point of convergence in front of the lens by extending the refracted rays in the opposite direction into the virtual space. And then we will find a point of convergence right here. Uh, so what that means is it's gonna look upright. The image is gonna look upright, magnified, so it's gonna be taller, larger. It's gonna be virtual because it's in virtual space if it's in front of the lens. All right, so when you're looking at it, all right, so it's gonna be, well, when I say it's in front of the lens, you're here, obviously. Object and the image will be in the same space. So this is known as the virtual space. That's the case. It's gonna look magnified as a result. Now we got the concave lenses. These are the divergent, diverging lenses. All right, so you got the focal lengths on both sides. All right, once again, you will have the same three rules. It's got one application only. All right, so ray parallel to the optical axis upon refraction is going to go through the focal point, or it's going to look as if it's going through the focal point from the imaginary space, or it's going to look like it's originating from the focal point. All right, so the next one is the ray, which is directed towards the focal point on the other side. Upon refraction, it's gonna go parallel to the optical axis. The third one, the ray, which is directed towards the center, is gonna go right through, just like before. So we got the same three, rule, three rules to support the point of convergence. Right, so this is the rule number one, rule number two, rule number three. All right, so these are the rays. All right, so which means that the diverging lens is gonna make something large smaller all right, so image formation by diverging lens, diverging lens. Object, these are the focal points. All right, so let's use the three rules. All right, so this ray parallel to the optical axis is gonna get refracted. It's gonna diverge away. All right, so find the refracted ray extended to the focal point. The ray which is directed towards the center is gonna go right through. So the point of convergence is gonna be here in front of the lens. Right, once again, guys, this is the virtual, virtual space. Image is going to be upright, it's going to be smaller. It's going to be virtual. All right, so. And then if you're looking at it from the other side, obviously you will get to see the virtual image. It's going to look smaller. All right. Applications. Studying the stars nearly cost a great scientist his life. From the History Channel, the official network of every millennium, this is Time Lab 2000. In 1610, scientist Galileo Galilei built the most powerful telescope of his day. Pretty incredible considering he's never actually seen one, only heard about it. Then Galileo makes a simple gesture that forever changes the course of history. He tilts his telescope up to the heavens and observes stars, planets, and the moon in greater detail than anyone has ever seen them. Remarkably, it nearly kills him. His observations convince him that the Earth moves around the sun. The church insists that the universe revolves around the Earth and tries Galileo for heresy. To avoid execution, he must publicly deny his greatest discovery. For the History Channel, I'm Sam Waterston. All right, so Galileo's telescope. Mm. Okay, so Galileo built himself a refracting telescope. Mm. He got two lenses, and then he shaved the lenses. One relatively thin, the other one is slightly thicker. Through trial and error, he discovered that you could actually magnify distant objects. All right, so you got lens number one, you got the lens number two. 
eyepiece is here, so you're looking through the lens from this direction on. Here's the first lens, it's the focal point of the first lens is here. If you get the second lens, the focal point of the second lens is gonna be here. All right, so the first lens is gonna have a smaller focal length, the second lens is gonna have a larger focal length. All right, that's the way you put here. So this is the ob objective and this is the eyepiece that you're looking at. We're looking through more like that. All right, so you got a distant object. So in this case, perhaps there's a star. Okay, so the whole idea of the telescope is to magnify the star. And then we have a converging lens. So what's gonna happen is the star, the image of the star is gonna form. So if it's a distant object like that, obviously the image is gonna be inverted, it's gonna be smaller, right? And the image is gonna be inverted, it's gonna be smaller. I'm just trying to <laughs> figure out the best geometry. Okay, because I'm trying to get the image to form inside the focal length of the eyepiece, all right? All right, so once the image forms inside the focal length of the eyepiece, right, so what's gonna happen is this is gonna end up creating a larger virtual image that I'm gonna be interested in. So the first image is gonna be inverted, it's gonna be smaller, it's gonna be real. All right, because it's gonna be real, this is gonna act like a real object that falls within the focal, focal length of the eyepiece. And all of a sudden we will get to use the same rate rules, all right, and then look for a point of convergence. So there's not gonna be point of convergence on this side. The point of convergence is gonna happen on this side in the virtual space. So which means that the, the uh, image is gonna converge to a point in front of the lens and it's gonna look bigger. All right, so this small star at a distance is gonna become magnified when you're looking through, through the eyepiece. All right, so that's what Galileo came up with, refracting the telescope. He didn't invent the telescope by no means. There are two glass makers in Holland yet. Some Italian guy was in Holland at the time, so he either heard of that invention or he has seen it, seen the demonstration of it. It was fairly impressive. And then he told Galileo about it, and that's it. So the Galileo thought to himself, well, let me just build one, check to see what happens. And then he noticed that you could magnify distant objects. And so he started studying the uh, star, he started looking at the planets, spent quite a bit of time studying the sun. You're not supposed to be looking directly into the sun. Obviously, he started to go blind after a while. So the final image is going to be virtual. It's going to be upside down. It's going to be virtual. It's going to be larger and whatnot. All right, so you got the distant object. You got the first converging lens. Image is going to form. It's going to be inverted. It's going to be real. It's going to form within the focal length of the eyepiece. And then obviously using the ray diagrams, you will come up with that point of convergence. So the final image is going to be, it's going to be larger. It's going to be virtual. And, it's, and that's it. Right, so that's how this works. All right, so let's do this and then go take a break. And then we got the compound microscope. All right, once again, you got two lenses. The first one is the objective, the second one is the eyepiece. All right, so the focal length of the first one, the focal length of the eyepiece. All right, now what are we doing? You're looking at something relatively small. Okay, the object that you're looking at is much smaller. So if it's a distant, if it's, if you're trying to magnify something um, like a star or whatever, it's at a distance, all right, so you keep that, it naturally falls outside of the radius of curvature. And then if you have a compound microscope, if you're trying to magnify something very small, obviously what you need to do is you have to keep it very close to the focal length, but it needs to be outside of the focal length. So what's gonna happen is uh, it's gonna have a real image. It's gonna be inverted, it's gonna be larger. It's gonna form once again within the focal length of the first one, I think. The eyepiece, that's what I'm trying to do with that. Just want to bring them near each other. All right, so, all right, so it's going to be real. It's going to be inverted. In reality, this should be larger at this point. I didn't draw these things right. So this is the first image. It's going to be real. It should be larger. And then once again, we do the same trick. Because this is a real image. It's going to act like an object. So we will get to magnify that one. And once again, just like a star, it's going to get magnified. All right, so it's going to be virtual. It's going to be upright. It's going to be magnified. Anyway, I'll actually break for 10. <clears throat> okay, so one more time. Let's focus, focus on the optical aberrations. <clears throat> okay, so when you have a lens, converging lens in this case, Notice that by the refracted rays towards the edges, not gonna converge to the same focal point. Uh, so they end up converging to different points in essence. So which means that it causes 
the image to smear out. So which means that the quality of the image that you're looking at, the resolution is not gonna be very good. It's gonna look fuzzy, that's what it means. It's gonna look fuzzy. And on top of that, when you're using lenses, now you're at the mercy of refraction. Okay, well, that's kind of obvious, which means that's giving you a refraction, but remember that different wavelengths will refract at different amounts. All right, so the red is gonna bend less, the violet is gonna end up bending more. <clears throat> so, uh, which means that you're gonna end up getting different points of convergence for different colors. That's what you're looking at. Notice that the red is converging to that point because it's bending less, blue is converging to a different point because uh, it's bending more. <clears throat> so what do we do? So which means that we have to do the corrections and how do we do the co corrections? We may end up combining the converging lens with the diverging lens, make sure that everything is converging to the same point, meaning that they're converging to the same focus in essence. We see it. All right, so that's, that was the problem that a lot of the telescopes usually have, all right? Because you don't get, these, you get multiple points of convergence and then next thing you know, you end up seeing this fuzzy smeared up image. Apple inspired Newton's law of gravity, <laughs> but it was actually a comet. From the History Channel, the official network of every millennium. This is Time Lab 2000. By 1680, Isaac Newton is already renowned for his brilliance. But for the last 10 years, he has retreated into seclusion. He dabbles in alchemy. His work goes unpublished. Then a spectacular comet appears in the night sky. His genius is reawakened. He emerges from isolation, builds a telescope to study the heavens, and decides to make his ideas public. The result, one of the most brilliant books in the history of science, the Principia. It lays out his revolutionary theory of gravity and the laws of motion. In the words of Alexander Pope, nature's laws lay hidden night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. For the History Channel, I'm Sam Waterston. Okay, so Newton and Earth's son, this problem came up with a reflecting telescope. Hmm. Of course, refraction often entails another kind of distortion because the refraction of light depends on its color. Light of different colors, initially mixed together in white light, is spread out into a rainbow of colors by this prism. This is the phenomenon of dispersion. It's the reason why, despite all its noteworthy power at the time, Galileo's telescope, a refracting telescope, was actually rather limited. But Isaac Newton realized that a prism and a lens affect light the same way, which meant that the refracting telescope would remain limited. And that's the reason why he invented the reflecting telescope. As it encounters a reflecting telescope, a beam of light reflected from a parabolic surface is reflected to a single point at the focus of the parabola <coughs> without dispersion, regardless of color. And that's why, ever since Isaac Newton invented it, the reflector telescope has been the handiest tool of the optical astronomer. Of course, what Isaac Newton realized was the refraction of light depends on its color would remain limited as it encounters a reflecting telescope as it encounters a reflecting telescope. Okay, so in order to get rid of the optical aberrations because of the, the uh, convergent lenses due to um, refraction phenomena, Newton came up with the idea of using these mirrors, concave mirrors. Okay, so once again, the mirror that they were using on the uh, space telescope, Hubble space telescope, that was a converging uh, mirror that they had. So they cut the mirror, they shaped it and everything else. And then obviously it sprung into a slightly different shape in space and its focal point completely changed. It didn't really change. So because of the fact that it ended up changing shape, instead of having a single focal, focal point, it ended up having a smeared focal point. So which means that the quality of the image was not as good under the circumstances. So how did they correct that? They ended up using a converging, converging lens in order to correct it. So that's what they did. All right, so here's the reflecting telescopes. You, once again, you get your eyepiece here. You got the incoming rays and you got the mirror. And then the, the reflected ray is going to converge to a point. All right, the point of convergence is going to be there. The image is going to be smaller. It's going to appear within the focal, focal length of the eyepiece. And then obviously, you're going to end up seeing the magnified image, virtual image at some point when you're looking at through the eyepiece for the reasons that I discussed before. I don't want to redraw things, it's the same idea. As the wounded Hubble telescope circled the Earth, an investigation traced its imperfection to human error. Computers had warned of problems with the mirror, warnings unaccountably ignored by optical supervisors. By a strange twist of fate, yet another human miscalculation would rescue Hubble. We were safe by Saddam Hussein. Before the invasion of Kuwait, there had been congressional and Senate hearings into it. And more promised in the fall. Well, then he invaded Kuwait, and I think um, that distracted the public opinion and gave us a window in which to fix the problem. 
In theory, Hubble's nearsightedness could be corrected by replacing its camera with one equipped with compensating lenses. A nickel-sized piece of corrective glass might restore its full vision. A shuttle crew of seven trained for nearly two years. The Endeavour repair mission succeeded beyond NASA's wildest dreams. Every one of the dozen planned tasks was carried out flawlessly. With its vision restored, Hubble allowed humans to see ten times more clearly than ever before. The same jump in resolution as when Galileo first pointed his spyglass towards the sky. This photo of Galaxy M100 was taken by Hubble in 1990. Here, the same region, viewed by the repaired telescope. It's a very, very exciting time to be doing astronomy. And everybody has their favorite objects, which they have studied for many years. And when you finally get the opportunity to take a Hubble picture of those objects, you'll suddenly see things that you hadn't suspected. You'll see things that you've long suspected but really wanted to prove. You know, you'll always learn something new. Hubble has put some of astronomy's most treasured imaginings to the test. What Hubble did was look at the center of a galaxy where we suspected there might be a black hole. A black hole is an object that is very, very dense and very, very small. So dense and so tiny that the speed of escape from that object exceeds the speed of light. So nothing can get out of it. Everything just gets sucked into it and disappears from the universe. Black holes have been fantasy and science fiction for, for decades. And what Hubble has done now is it's shown us that black holes are scientific fact. My friends all think that the moon is bigger when it's on the horizon. I think that the moon is bigger when it's on the horizon. So what could be causing it to look so different? The moon doesn't really change its apparent size uh, from the horizon to overhead, but our perception is that it's larger. One theory is that our mind judges the moon's size in relation to other objects. It looks much larger at the horizon because there are things we can compare it to, whereas at the top of the sky, it's out there by its, its little old self. In other words, if we see a large object such as a house dwarfed by the moon, our mind tells us that the moon must be enormous. But when the moon is out by itself, our mind doesn't make that assumption. We see the moon as small. Okay, so it's, a, it's an illusion. Another possible cause of this is the Ponzo illusion, named after Mario Ponzo, who suggested that the mind judges the size of an object based on its background. Ponzo drew two identical bars across a picture of railroad tracks as they recede in the distance. The upper bars look wider because they appear to span the rails compared to the lower bars, which fits between the rails. But in fact, the lines overlaid on the tracks are the same size at both ends. Go out and take a pencil, and when the moon's rising, put the pencil out at arm's length and see how big the moon is compared to the eraser on the pencil. And then go out a couple hours later and do the same thing when the moon is higher in the sky, and you'll see that the moon is exactly the same size in relation to the pencil eraser at both times. Okay, so the appearance of the moon being lighter near the horizon, it's just the illusion of the mind. That's it. There's no explanation for it from a physics perspective. 